appreciate you all being here. Got a lot of great legislation to sign today. Should be, uh, should be a great uh, morning. Go ahead and grab a seat. You're in for uh, some, some speeches from a few folks. Uh, we'll sign some bills. Okay, do we have any kids in the audience? We may have pens for you, too, with some of that, so stay tuned. We'll make sure to do that. Uh, we're uh, really excited to be, to be back in Tampa. You know, uh, I feel very strongly as governor, but also just as a dad of a six, a five, and a three-year-old, that um, you know, we need to let our kids just be kids. And we have a very crazy age that we live in. Uh, there's a lot of nonsense that gets floated around. And what we've said in Florida is uh, we are going to remain a refuge of sanity and a citadel of normalcy. And kids should have an upbringing uh, that, that reflects that. And I think that there's a lot of uh, emphasis in other parts of the country and our society as a whole uh, to take that away from them. And we're not going to let that happen here in Florida. And today is proof of that. So, so we're here in Hillsborough County, and you've seen different things happen right here. I mean, the parents found uh, a number of pornographic materials here in schools funded uh, by uh, your tax dollars. And at one point, you even had the school board vote uh, to not remove it, even though clearly was not appropriate for these young people. Uh, there have also been policies that make kids pick pronouns and, uh, and even hide that from their parents. Uh, and then, of course, here in Cambridge Christian, they had to file a lawsuit against the Florida High School Athletic Association just to be able to pray before athletic games. And so we think all of that is problematic, and we're addressing all of that here today. And joining me today is our Commissioner of Education, uh, Manny Diaz, as well as our Agency for Healthcare Administration Secretary, Jason Weida. And we've got a number of our legislators who've been involved in these bills that are here today. We have Senator Clay Yarborough and Senator Jay Collins from Jay is here local. We have representatives Randy Fine, Adam Anderson, Linda Cheney, Ralph Masulo, Robert Brackett, Jennifer Kennedy, Karen Gonzalez Pittman, Fred Hawkins, and Laura Saunders Plakin. Welcome to all the legislators and thank you for being here. We're also joined by Sean Minks, who's the head of, uh, head of Cambridge Christian School, uh, Luca Hine, who you'll hear from and has experience in some of the things that we're talking about, uh, mother from Indian River County, Tiffany Hansen, and you're going to hear their stories uh, later. Uh, it is important that we stand up for our youth, and we're doing that in a number of ways here today. Uh, some of the stuff is kind of sad that we even have some of these discussions. Uh, when you see what's going on, and we stopped it uh, administratively in Florida uh, last year, but we needed to have the legislature make this permanent, you have a movement amongst, I would say, rogue elements of the medical establishment uh, to do things that uh, is basically the mutilation of minors. I mean, they're trying to do sex change operations on minors, giving them things like puberty blockers, and doing things that are irreversible. Uh, to them. And that is not based on science. Uh, that is not based on evidence. In fact, you have had countries that have tried to do this in Europe and they recognize this was very harmful. And so now they don't do it, places like Sweden. And yet here in the United States, you have a very, um, I would say, ideologically charged small group of folks within medicine that are really pushing these types of procedures on minors. Uh, we think that that is wrong. In Florida last year, we took action so that uh, no physician that does those procedures are going to be able to keep their medical license. So that's gone if you do this, which is great. But when we do do the SB 254, uh, this will permanent outlaw the mutilation of minors. Uh, it will outlaw the surgical procedures and experimental puberty blockers for minors. It will also require any adults receiving these surgeries to be informed about the irreversible nature 
and about the dangers of the procedures. Uh, it will give Florida courts temporary jurisdiction to intervene and halt procedures for out-of-state children. Uh, you have actually some states in this country that want to be a haven for these types of procedures and even welcome minors without their parents' consent into some of their jurisdiction. We're obviously doing the opposite here, and I think this, is, this provision is important. This is going to create a way to recover damages for injury or death resulting from mutilating surgeries or these experimental puberty blockers that are given to a minor. Because what happens, they go through this, then they get older, and this is a huge problem. They should be able to sue the physician uh, who hurt them, and they're now going to be able to with this law. So that's the first law that, that we're going to be signing today. Uh, the other law, HB 169, I think is very important. It's basically an expansion of last year's parental rights and education bill. But crucially, uh, this bill uh, makes sure that Florida students and teachers will never be forced to declare pronouns in school or be forced to use pronouns not based on biological sex. We never did this through all of human history until like, what, two weeks ago? Now this is something they're having third graders declare pronouns. Uh, we're not doing the pronoun Olympics in Florida. It's not happening here. And so, and so that will be protections for people. Again, let the kids be kids. Let them be in school like normally. And it's inappropriate to force them to try to choose these pronouns and, and to do that. Uh, this also expands uh, what we had last year. They said no uh, sexuality or things like transgender ideology or gender, gender theory in grades K through 3. Actually, what you saw is some people were trying to jam it into pre-K to get around that law. So this says pre-K and also goes up to grade 8, because I think what we've seen in these, in these libraries and in some of the books, uh, there's clearly a concerted effort uh, to try to do indoctrination in the middle school grades. And so the legislature, I think, has looked at that evidence and wisely said that, you know, on those issues, if a parent wants to engage um, in that with their kid at those lay ages, then, then that's up to them. But we should not be putting that in the curriculum uh, in school. And so we're not doing that. We're going to be focusing on math. We're going to be focusing on reading. We're going to focus on science. We're going to be focusing on the subjects that really, really matter for our, for our kids. So that's really important. Third bill, HB 1438. And this is sad that, that you kind of have to do this. You know, there's these adult performances. There are these, like, you know, these drag shows, sexually explicit in what they're doing. And look, adult entertainment, you know, people can, can, can do what, 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 they, what they want with some of that. But... Um, to have minors there, I mean, you'll have situations where you'll have like an eight-year-old girl there where you have these like really explicit shows, uh, and that is just inappropriate. And I think in Florida, what we've said, and we've taken some action administratively already against some of the offending establishments, but the reality is we needed the legislature to come in and really, really clarify that if you are uh, an establishment that's having adult performances, you have an obligation to make sure that these young kids are not permitted in the premises. And we're going to hold you accountable uh, if you're not meeting that obligation. You know, there's certain things we would never say it'd be okay, you know, to have a, to have a 12 year old um, at some of these things. And so we want to make sure that that is, that is uniform. Uh, when you have adult entertainment, when you have these sexually explicit performances, uh, there should not be any of these kids there. And this is going to make sure that that's the case. And so HB 1438 uh, will be signed into law momentarily. We also are going to sign HB 1521, which is ensuring women's safety, making sure that educational institutions, detention facilities, correctional institutes, juvenile facilities, and public buildings with a restroom, locker room, or changing facility, that they must have uh, separate facilities for men and women based on biological sex. A woman... <laughs> A, a woman should not be in a locker room having to worry about someone from the opposite sex being in their locker room. 
and it's happening with the athletics, with our with our girl girl athletes and women athletes. Uh, also, with some of these other things, whether it's a prison situation, uh, whether it's just the, the, these restrooms. Uh, you know, we want to make sure uh, that our girls and our women are protected. And so this bill does that and makes sure that they're not going to be exposed uh, to situations that, that are not in their best interest. And then finally, HB 225, um, expanding access to youth sports. This is going to do a number of things. One, it's going to allow private school, virtual school, and homeschool students to participate in sports and extracurricular activities at public or private schools, regardless of their zip code. We think it's important that they're able to do that, and, and this is going to expand that ability here in the state of Florida. It also preserves the First Amendment right to speech, including public prayer at the beginning of high school sporting events. How do we get into a situation, um, and you're going to hear the, um, uh, um, from the school here, about not allowing prayer before, before a game, the athletic association somehow putting the kibosh on? I'm sorry, you have a right to free expression of religion. If government is denying your right to say a prayer before the game, they are infringing your speech. You're not violating anything by, by doing that. And so for them to do it is discriminatory. So we're making sure, and the idea that we would have to litigate this in court uh, is really, really unbelievable. So Sean Minx is gonna come talk about, you know, what they did here. But it's sad that we in this country have a high school coach from Washington State after the game, just would go to, ha go to the midfield in football, say a prayer. Some people wanted to do it, some didn't, that's fine. So he leads people that wanted to do it in prayer. And he got suspended from his position by the school system up in Washington State for that. He had to go all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court to be able uh, to get his job back and to say that yeah, you didn't do anything wrong. So we've, uh, we're gonna make sure we're protecting people and we're making sure that they have the ability uh, to speak and to pray, you know, as they see fit as individuals. Uh, and part of the way we're going to be able to do that is we have a high school athletic association, Florida High School uh, Athletic Association, and it's, it's, it's not really subject to much accountability. It's kind of just been there as a private body. Uh, what this bill does is it imposes oversight over it. It allows more gubernatorial appointments and uh, and the like. And, and part of the reason we need to do that is we passed two years ago the Fairness in Women's Sports Act to say we're going to make sure our girls and our women athletes are able to compete with integrity. And you can't be competing on the men's team for three years, switch to the women's, and what, all of a sudden you're the champion? That is not right. And so we wanted to make sure that we were uh, ensuring fairness for them. It took them like 18 months to be able to implement that uh, through the athletic association. And I'm just thinking to myself, you know, that should have taken a couple weeks to be able to do. Uh, I also remember when COVID was going on, we made the decision uh, earlier than just about any other state that, that our schools were gonna be open, kids needed to be in school, you can't just lock them out of life. And we said they need to have youth activities in the summer and, and sports should be there when the school year started in the summer of 2021. And there was this whole hubbubaloo about whether the Florida High School Athletic Association was gonna allow sports. And they had a lot of people kind of give statements in front of a hearing that they did. This was sometime in the summer of 2020. And these are all people that were on their medical advisory board or something. And almost every one of these physicians said, that it would be catastrophic to allow kids to, to compete in sports because of COVID. Now that was crazy to say even at the time. And, and I knew that that was false. And we said, you know, you're, you have a right to play. If you don't wanna play, then don't play. That's fine, I get that. But people wanted to play. And a lot of these medical people were trying to shut it down. And fortunately we were able uh, to really work hard and, and save the sports season for, for kids. But had we not done that, I mean, that would have been really, really negative for a lot of families throughout the state of Florida. And I remember going to football games that fall, and I'd go to the locker room and tell the, tell the kids, I was like, hey, be thankful you're here in Florida. Because if you were in California, you'd be on your couch right now. You would not be on a football field because they didn't let them play sports. But seeing that and 
I, I just, I, I think like, how could you be a doctor and have every one of these physicians just be so wrong about what was going on? There was not a major COVID risk for high school athletes. They needed to be playing. There's far more damage that would be done by locking them out of sports than by putting them in sports. And so we were able to get over that hump but yeah, I just look back and I'm like, you know, there needs to be some changes at this organization uh, when you have that type of advice coming in that was just so detached from reality and was really more based on hysteria than based on sound science. So, so that will change when we, when we sign this. So all in all, this is a, an incredible package of bills. I think this is something that we just made the, de the decision as a, as a state and, and, and me as governor to just say, um, you know, we're protecting kids, and we're going to protect kids when, uh, when it's popular. We'll protect kids even when, when you take some incoming as a result of maybe offending some ideologies or some agendas out there, but that's fine. Uh, we're happy to do that because this is important, and I look forward to uh, signing these momentarily. And, you know, we'll be signing it, of course, as governor, but also just as a dad. I appreciate the legislature stepping up. Um, and making sure that, uh, that we're going to have strong environments for our kids to learn uh, and to grow as Floridians. Okay, Sean Minx, head of Cambridge Christian School, come on up. My name is Sean Minx, and I serve as head of school here at Cambridge. And on behalf of the students, staff, teachers, and school board, I'm pleased to welcome Governor DeSantis to Cambridge Christian School. We are grateful for his leadership of this state. Cambridge Christian School partners with parents and the church to minister to students and families by sharing the message of Jesus Christ and the Bible. We are focused on providing our families with a rigorous educational experience that also allows the students to grow their talents in the arts and athletics. Serving students from one year old to 12th grade allows Cambridge to partner with families, literally from infancy to diploma. Partnership with families should be the goal of every school. Today, Governor DeSantis makes the families of the state of Florida an equal partner in education. When families are partners in education and the values they hold are prioritized, students excel. From the beginning, now 60 years ago, Cambridge has sought to raise up future leaders who academically, socially, and spiritually serve the local and global community for Christ. But seven years ago, that commitment came under question in a request to pray over the loudspeaker at a football game. By banning a pregame prayer over the loudspeaker, the FHSAA sent a message to our students that prayer is inappropriate to lead publicly in large forums. Today, the state of Florida teaches a different lesson, one that supports free speech and respects the religious freedom of students across the state. After today, schools will be allowed to make opening remarks before state championship games, supporting important principles of free speech that have made this nation great. I don't know what other schools or students will say during those opening remarks. That's up to them. But I do know that the next time Cambridge Christian returns to play for a state championship, and we will return. <laughs> we will pray over the loudspeaker before kickoff. For that, we thank the Florida legislature and the leadership of Governor DeSantis. Thank you. Okay, Luca Hine, come on up. Hi, so my name is Luca Hine, and while I'm not from Florida, I am someone who went through the gender affirming care industry as a minor. Um, and a little bit of background about me I was a teenager with multiple comorbidities and mental health issues who was struggling and was put down this path instead of given the help I actually needed, resulting in the first medical intervention I ever had being a double mastectomy at 16. 
I was one of the kids that needed a chance to just grow up and get the help I needed. I was one of the kids that needed the adults to step up and do what is right. And I've worked with kids. I've seen how they experience the world, and they experience the world in this very magical and innocence-filled way. And introducing kids to these concepts, making them a permanent patient of the medical industry, is taking that away from them. Children deserve a chance to grow up whole and discover themselves in a way that will not link them to an experimental medical industry for the rest of their lives. I will live with the results of what was done with, to me for the rest of my life, including all the health issues I deal with because of it. But other kids don't have to now, thanks to what has gone on here in Florida. And I applaud Florida for going through the medical board and now protecting kids in a more permanent way via legislation. Kids deserve a chance to grow up, and that is what is happening today. It's not about hate. It's about giving kids a chance to grow up whole. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Great job. Okay, Tiffany Hansen, come on up. Good morning. My name is Tiffany. I am a mother of five from Indian River County. When I send my child to school, I expect their education to be at the forefront of what they are being taught. Unfortunately, children are being coached, coerced, and indoctrinated with transgender ideology. I have seen it firsthand and more than just one of my kids. I, as a parent, have experienced my child suffer from depression, anxiety, body dysmorphia, PTSD, and suicidal ideation as a result. One day, my daughter came home and told me she wanted to be called by different pronouns and felt like she was a different gender. I didn't think much of it at first, as she is young. I was being supportive. As time went on, I realized how deep this had gotten and how much this was influencing her life in a negative way. Unknown to me, the schools had been secretly pushing this transgender ideology in the classroom behind my back, encouraging her to question her gender, her sexuality, and her preferred pronouns. To this day, she has had to under undergo therapy because it has taken such a toll on her mental health. It wasn't just her. More than one of my children have come home telling me the exact same thing. They are being taught to question their entire identity by schools. These are fourth and sixth grade kids we are talking about here. This ideology can be seriously damaging to children, forcing them to question themselves to the extent that they have body dysmorphia and suicidal thoughts in fourth grade. This has to stop now. As someone who has also had to deal with personal childhood trauma in the past, I understand what it is like to be this young and feel these feelings. I am against this, not for religious reasons. I am standing up because I am a parent, and nobody gets to raise my children except me. When parents... <laughs> when parents stand up to the targeting of their children by some teachers, school staff, we are discriminated against and labeled homophobic, transphobic, hateful, or unsupportive. They are telling kids that teachers are your ally for supporting you in this forced identity, and parents are the enemy. This is disturbing and completely unacceptable, but mostly unlawful. I am proud to stand here today in support of these bills. Thank you, Governor DeSantis, for standing up for our parental rights and saving our children.
Okay, Clay. Clay. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for the invitation to join you today, Governor. It was an honor to carry uh, several of these bills in the Senate. Thank you for your leadership. Governor, you consistently deliver, and thanks to you and your leadership, kids can be kids in the state of Florida. As a dad of young children myself, I know you understand how important it is for parents to know what is going on with their children. You continue to do what you say you're going to do and have always put families and children first. With Ron DeSantis, it's promises made, promises kept. On behalf of all parents in Florida and the United States, thank you for standing up for us, Governor. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Randy Fine, and I had the privilege of carrying a couple of the bills the governor mentioned um, a little bit earlier. But the important thing for people to know is there is evil in this world, and we are fighting it here today. And the most important job that I have, the most important job the governor has, is that we are parents of children. And when I try to explain to my 11-year-old the bills that I file in Tallahassee, when I try to explain to my 11-year-old what bottom surgery is and what top surgery is, what adult entertainment is, there's no age-appropriate way to do that. The fight that we have had here in Florida is about the fundamental nature of childhood itself. Because the other side believes that 8-year-olds should pick their pronouns, that 9-year-olds should read books about sex, that 10-year-olds should be able to see, take puberty blockers, that 11-year-olds should be able to get experimental drugs, and 12-year-olds should be able to have healthy body parts cut off. In the state of Florida, we have said this is going to stop. And we're going to do it because God does not make mistakes with our children. Now, I am proud to be here with my colleagues from the Florida House, all of whom fought alongside me, as well as my senator, particularly my friend Ralph Masulo, who ran this bill alongside me. These bills are not easy to run. You take a lot of heat and you take a lot of pain when you do them. And that's why the person I want to credit the most is the person standing to my right. Because none of this happens without leadership. None of this happens without being willing to take the punches, to hear the names, to lean in, because we are right. There is evil in this world. We are standing up for our children. At the end of the day, Ron DeSantis and this legislature, we fight for children. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Great job. Thanks so much. All right. Well, appreciate that. And we're uh, excited to be able to sign all of these uh, b bills momentarily. So I don't know, do we have some of our some of the students? So whoever wants to come over here on stage, come on up.